we can turn to Exodus chapter 20. I'm using a few Bible page numbers are there in the bulletin for you. We're starting our summer series today. Christina joked I should have brought a gray wig and a brown robe. I'm Alice Carlton Heston, you know, uh, since we're starting the Ten Commandments today, but uh, I passed on that. <laughs> well, we go. However, uh, before we begin, uh, on the Ten Commandments, I think it's important for us to all be on the same page as far as well, what are they, uh, who wrote them, all those types of different questions that are commonly asked, and uh, let's begin by covering four topics, and this will serve as an introduction to this, and then we'll look at the first command today. What are the Ten Commandments? Well, if we went around the room, we would probably hear a few uh, what they are, and uh, you could read right here, I guess, and cheat and know that they're all there, and you could name a few, but for many of us, uh, we, we struggle because we never really dove in what are the Ten Commandments, why, why even study this? And uh, throughout history, uh, they've been historically referred to as the Decalogue. Uh, their precepts, their commands, their direct commands from God made to the children of Israel in the second person. Now, this was not a common uh, way of teaching in those days. Most people taught in the third person, especially when it came to laws. And this is known as God's law. Uh, it was not common to write in this way, which means something further, and we'll get to it here in a minute. But you'll notice the commands are not exhaustive. They're not long. They're short. They're precise. They can be grouped into two categories. The first three deal with our vertical relationship with God. And the, set, the bottom seven deal with our horizontal relationship with people. So they're not long, but they do have a purpose. They were to show Israel how to live faithfully before God. We'll get into more of that here in just a moment. So, uh, next question. What background, what was going on in Israel at this time? Now, if you remember, this is part of the challenge of not leading up to this point in Exodus. However, if you remember right, Moses led the people out of Egypt. This had happened, this had taken, this had taken place, and as you read... Uh, what was going on in Israel, the people were amok, right? They were running amok. There were all sorts of things going on. There was no rules, uh, laws uh, to govern this people in Israel. So uh, Moses goes up on the Mount Sinai and God gives him these Ten Commandments. Now, the wording is odd. It's hard to say exactly how this happened um, because the wording is just hard to translate in Hebrew to English. However, what we do know is that what was going on while Moses was up there on the mount was quite uh, revealing about what Israel's true intentions were. Israel was given to all sorts of evils, right? They were starting to build a golden calf. They were doing all these idols they worshipped back in Egypt. They're saying, where's Moses? Why should we worship this guy or his God? Why should we do all these things? It was so quick that they had forgotten what God had done for them. As humans, we normally don't like a lot of rules, a lot of laws. But if we're honest with each other, we know that discipline, that structure is often good for us. Third question, why are we studying the Ten Commandments this summer? Well, uh, back around Christmas, I think, I, I picked up book. I'll show you here in a minute, but uh, and it, it led through the Ten Commandments and their need for our society today. Again, we've grown up, we've heard them, we've seen them on the different court battles and different things that have happened over the years, but how do they apply to this century? How do they apply for the church today? You'll hear people say, well, we should obey some of them, but not all of them. It was Old Testament. It was for Israel. That's not necessarily true, and I'll deal with that more as we go. But in this book, I'll leave it up here if anyone's interested in seeing it, but 
It's uh, by Kevin DeYoung. Uh, he's a good pastor, author, writes very easy. I put in one of his books in the graduates' bags every year. It's called Just Do Something. It's on the will of God. It's, uh, it's pivotal and a transformational time in my life. And uh, it's good reading. It's easy to read. Well, I'll be quoting from that book very often on the Ten Commandments because he puts things very simply for the church. Uh, he gives five reasons why we should study the Ten Commandments. Here they are, and I think they are applicable to us as we begin today. The first one is, as I said, there's a general ignorance about the Ten Commandments. Yes, we know them, but how do they apply? How do I remember the Sabbath? That's a big one, right? What's it really mean, thou shalt not kill? Does that mean we can't kill anything? Well, then we, we all be vegetarians, right? Uh, thou shalt not steal. What, what exactly does that mean? Right? There's a general ignorance about what some of these things mean. We need to study to understand these things. Second reason we should study the Ten Commandments. Because they are historical instruction. Time and time again in the New Testament, you see Jesus and the New Testament authors referring back to the law. They're quoting the law. They're referring back to the Ten Commandments. The law that God gave. All the Bible is good for instruction for us. Third thing, uh, we should study the Ten Commandments because of the ethics of it. The mosaic ethics of the Old Testament. Now, ethics is a big word. Olivia reminded me last week I need to define big words because sometimes uh, we're not all on the same page about what they mean. She thought I meant something by some word I said last week that meant totally opposite of what it meant. So, uh, by ethics, what I mean is ethics are moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. So it's why we do what we do. It's why when somebody steals something from us, we don't go and steal it back from them, right? It's why we do what we do, the reason behind that behavior. Fourth reason we should study the Ten Commandments is because they were key to the New Testament ethics and the <coughs> They were key to what Paul and Peter talked about in the New Testament when it comes to the ethics uh, that Christians should live by. God never abandoned the Ten Commandments. And we see that as we move along. And then the last reason is this. Simply because we should study these commandments because the law is good. Romans 7.12 So the law is holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The law is good. We should study this for no other reason. Uh, and ultimately, I believe, we should study the Ten Commandments because we should not view them as a law as we think of today. Uh, most of the time, and even during this time in history, you'll find laws were written in the third person and then there was a consequence. However, we find God writing these in the second person and we find that there's no consequences right away. So that leads me to believe it's more than just God's laws. This was a covenant document between God and His people so that they would know how to live faithfully for Him. Therefore, it transcends both the Old Testament and New Testament and today. What I mean is, what was said then applies to us today. We need these laws in our hearts so that we know how to live faithfully for God. Which leads me to our last question. Why should we obey the Ten Commandments? Why should we obey? And we have to put this in our mind. I believe, as I started working through this, I believe it's more than just studying them. It's a reasonable, it's a reasonable belief in your mind to know, I'm going to obey these commands after I hear them. Because that's what they're meant to do. In order to live faithfully for God, we obey His commands. First reason we should obey His commands. Because we're Christians. We are Christians. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. As Christians, 
we are God's people and we have been set apart to live according to God's ways. That is what we do as Christians. The Ten Commandments are part of this. Second, we should obey the commands because of who God is. Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is who God is. He is the law giver. And ultimately, it gives us, as the law giver, it gives us a glimpse into the character and what is on the heart of God. It's as if God is saying, this is what is important to me. Do these things. Third reason we should obey. Exodus 19.5 now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. God gives us commands for our good. This is for our good. Fourth, we should obey because of where we are. First John 5, 3, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. Uh, one person said, the Ten Commandments are rules for a free people. God had just freed Israel to stay free. This is what God desires for a free people, His people. And then fifth, we should obey the Ten Commandments because of what God has done. Uh, John 14, 15. You'll probably remember this verse. It says, if you love me, you will keep my if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So for no other reason, this is why we keep the commandments uh, today and tomorrow and so on, right? All of our doing is only because of what He has first done for us. So those are five reasons we should obey the commandments. I wanted us all to be on the same page. Uh, introductions, I don't like long introductions, but I think it was necessary for us to be on the same page when it comes to the Ten Commandments in our study this summer. Uh, so, my goal for the rest of our time is to look at the first commandment and better understand that God is God alone. All right? God is God alone. Now, this summer, since it's a summer series, I'm going to have kids kind of help us this summer. Olivia, will you come? She's going to read our first commandment this week. It's a good way to have kids get involved in the service and to see their red faces. <laughs> You shall have no other gods before me. You get the easy one this week. <laughs> Alright. You shall have no other gods before me. First commandment. First. Know your idols. Know your idols. You shall have no other gods. God is one. This is not something unique to the Christian worldview. However, it is part of the Christian worldview. God is monotheistic. We believe in one God. And He is the only God that should be worshipped. Now, if you remember, as that background information, the people had already started worshipping these idols, these, these carbon images, these things that we'll deal with here in the coming weeks. But they had already started to go back to what they had learned in Egypt. You can see God establishing His authority right off the bat. He is a unique God, and there is none like Him. He is God, and God alone, and He demands our worship. We'll do more of that. God is also relational. God desires to have a covenant relationship with His people. There's a covenant loyalty that He demands. As Creator, as Sustainer, as Authoritarian, we, he has that privilege. He has that right. He can say, I demand your worship, and we give it to him. This was the case for Israel. This was the case for the first church, and I believe it belongs to us today as well. All of our loyalty belongs to God as Christians. That is what we do as Christians. We belong to him. No other gods before him. Why? Because God is a jealous God. Now, that word jealous, I, I tend to not like that word because we have a different understanding for it today than what God has established. But the worship of the one true God is the only acceptable belief and practice for believers. 
is the only acceptable belief. You can't serve God in some other little God, if you will, little G God, uh, and worship Him. Now, Matthew, Jesus deals with this in Matthew 6.24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Now, money is that little God here. And you could replace that with a lot of different things, and you would find that there are a lot of little gods that come into our lives in sneaky ways. I'll, I'll build on that here in a minute. Now, we could step back, look at Israel and say, God has done all these things for you. Why are you turning your back on Him? Why are you running back to those little idols? Why are you doing that? Well, before we get on that page, uh, we need to step back and realize we're not so different ourselves. Now, our idols may look different, but we have our idols as well. This morning at our girl breakfast, some of the guys were talking about how hard it is to even notice those things. We take so many things and how hard it is to live this Christian life just for God. It takes a daily focus, and I believe that's why this one is first. It's because it takes a daily focus to keep our focus on God. Now, in his book, uh, The Reason for God, Tim Keller, uh, pastor in New York, he, he gives a few idols that we take for granted today. Some of these will be uh, probably touch a nerve, but that's usually a good thing for us. I know it did for me uh, personally as I began reading this. Uh, and unfortunately, I think we've all fallen prey to at least one of these, if not all. Uh, here's a few idols he gives in our culture today. Uh, one, the first one is this. Uh, family is often an idol in our lives. He says this, if you center your life and identity on your spouse or partner, you will be emotionally dependent and jealous and controlling. The other person's problems will be overwhelming to you. If you center your life and identify on your family and children, you will try to live your life through your children until they resent you or have no self of their own. At worst, you may treat them poorly when they displease you. Right? These idols of family. The second one he gives is work often becomes an idol. He says this, if you center your life and identity on your work and career, you will be a driven workaholic and a boring, shallow person. At worst, you will lose family and friends, and if your career goes poorly, you will de develop deep and severe depression. The third idol he gives is money. If you center your life and identity on money and possessions, you'll be eaten up by worry or jealousy about money. You may be even willing to do unethical things to maintain your status or the lifestyle you have grown to desire. Then that fifth idol he gives is often leisure. Leisure can become an idol. If you center your life and identity on pleasure, gratification, and comfort, you will find yourself getting addicted to something. You will become chained to the escape strategies by which you avoid the hardness of life. Now, if you're like me, uh, you've fallen prey to at least one of those, where you try to find your identity in something else. Now, maybe it's uh, something, a noble cause someone has. Maybe it's something else that's not lifted, listed here. But you get the point. Our hearts get pulled away towards these other things that are not God. These other things that we start living for instead of God. I'm guilty, the family one especially. You can start getting pulled away and that your life becomes centered around your family. And where's God in that picture? You wake up one day and you realize He's no one. Right? There's this temptation by all believers, and we see it in Israel right here as Moses is getting these Ten Commandments. They're doing this very thing. They want leisure. They want these idols, and that will deal more of this next week uh, about no graven images. They want this thing they can control. Yet the whole time they're not realizing God, God is the one who's in control. God is the one we serve as Christians. 1 John 5.21 J 
Jesus says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Why? Because second, you know your idols, you know your God. Know your God. Remember back, you shall have no other gods before me. Now that before me uh, section there, it simply means against me or in my presence. There, there's a couple different ways that can be translated. All false gods stand in opposition to the one true God. You can't worship these other idols, these other false gods, and worship God at the same time. You can't have a foot in both doors. You're either worshiping God or you're not. Now, while I say that, I realize it's not always easy. Uh, I think sometimes we can read these things and we can kind of skim over, especially something we've read before, and we don't type, uh, take time to meditate and realize how difficult this really is. So many things pull for our attention. So many things want our desires, our, our needs. We want to, and it's so easy for us to give in, right? We give in. And sometimes we realize it, sometimes we don't. And there are times in our lives where we have to step back and say, no, God is first. He demands and needs my worship. God has made Himself known. And in our passage, He said this, if you look back at verses 1 and 2, uh, chapter 20. It says, And God spoke all these words, saying, realize what's happening here. God is making Himself known in the Ten Commandments. He's making Himself known to His people. Uh, verse 2, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The two things. He's making it clear. He's establishing His authority that they are to worship him in these Ten Commandments. Why? First, that uh, I am the Lord your God. Look at the first part of that verse 2. Yahweh is the way God would identify Himself as the sovereign God, the Creator over all things. The Hebrews would have known this. They would have known the authority that comes with that phrase. Second, He is the God who brought them out of Egypt. He's reminding the nation of Israel what He has done for them. So he, know, he not only has the authority, he's also telling them, you've seen this before. You've seen what I can do. You know who I am. And I will take care of you. God demands our worship. And not only this, ultimately, he wants them to know, God is God alone. There are no others. There is no one like Him. Psalm 86.10 For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. God is God alone. So, as we conclude, as we wrap up, I think we need to take a moment and realize and ask ourselves some tough questions. The Ten Commandments, they apply just as much today as they did then. They transcend time. They're just as applicable today as they were thousands of years ago in the desert. We need them in our lives. God is God alone. He demands your worship and your soul worship. Your only worship. You can't have a foot in two doors. So we must recognize the idols in our lives. We need to take a step back and take a moment and realize there are things that buy for our time. They want our time. They want our worship. What are they? Well, ask yourself four questions, okay? First, who do you often praise? When I say that, I'm saying, who do you often uh, talk well about? Who do you often, uh, for me, it, it could be the Cubs, right? Uh, who do I often praise? Well, the Cubs are doing well, that's who I'm talking about. Second question, and I'll, I'll explain the answers to these here in a moment. Who do you often count on? Where do you run when things go hard? What's your first uh, response to when things go bad? Third question, who do you often call for? 
So who are you often calling for when maybe things are going well, things are going bad, whatever the situation is, who are you, who are you calling for in those moments? And then last question, who do you often thank? Uh, you can thank this person for this, this person for that. But who are you often thinking? Now, if any of those answers are something else besides God first, you know your idols. That's where your idols are. And maybe it's yourself. Maybe it is someone else. Whatever those idols are, we must, as Christians, after knowing, you shall have no other gods before me. We must repent. We must confess it to God. Seek His forgiveness. Trusting that He will help change our hearts to desire Him more. Desire to please Him more. If the focal point of our lives is anything besides God, then we need to repent of that and believe and trust Christ with our lives. Now, if God is not the focal point and you don't realize or see the necessity of Him being the focal point, then I think it's an opportunity for you to evaluate, am I really a Christian? And that's too often we, we neglect that. Maybe we go to church all the time. Maybe we can say the right words. But if we don't see the necessary and the necessity of the gospel of Jesus being worshipped number one in our lives, maybe we're not a Christian. Repent and believe the gospel today. That's the only hope and answer for you. Come talk to me. Talk to Christina. Talk to someone here that you know can share that good news with you and we'll walk down that with you uh, in this life. We'll walk on that journey with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your goodness, your grace to us. We thank you, God, that uh, you are the one true God. You are God alone. None are like you. Forgive us for the times we get drawn away, for the times we, we live for self, for the times we live for our family, our work, our money, leisure, anything that may take us away from our, our worship of you. Father, we need you uh, to help us in this because uh, it's hard. It's so easy to get drawn away. Father, we need you to help put up those blinders for us, to help put up those uh, reminders in our lives. And help us to be faithful in diving into your scriptures. Help our mind to be on spiritual things. Because without you, we're ultimately doomed. Father, we pray for those who uh, have never trusted this gospel. Have never trusted uh, Jesus with their lives. And it's always been about them. Father, we pray that you will convict their hearts. And that they'll see the need for the gospel of Jesus Christ in their lives, and that they will embrace it, live for it, and desire to share this good news.